Good morning, everyone. Good morning. <laughs> um, so this was brought about by um, um, a sermon that I delivered in 2018 about great moments in UU history. And it was suggested since that sort of fell into um, sort of ended before we hit the modern times, there simply was too long a topic that we reintroduce it and have it a uh, Unitarian Universalist history part one and part two. Um, so I'll start out with a quote from the venerable Thomas Starr King, as I hope to add to my 2018 uh, service. Um, he was credited with describing the difference between Unitarians and Universalists in the following statement. Universalists believe that God is too good to damn men. In this case, we might say humanity. <clears throat> Unitarians believe that man is too good to be damned. <laughs> and uh, I thought that was a fascinating uh, uh, sort of overview, very sort of simple quote um, to, to, to have on that. Um, I will start personally, my story. Um, I have been attending Unitarian Universalist churches since 1968, when I was uh, a preschooler in Connecticut. I was impressed in that experience that I was able to not just immerse myself in the glories of the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jesus, but also the many Norse, Hindu, Greek, Roman gods, um, Judaism, um, Buddhism. And as I grew up as a Unitarian Universalist, I also noticed as I migrated to various parts of the country, uh, and left Connecticut that there was a certain focus oftentimes in various congregations. Certain Unitarian Universalist ministers would perhaps focus a little more on certain faith traditions or certain issues um, or certain causes. And in those times, the literature for newcomers emphasized a Judeo-Christian heritage. I don't think we do that anymore, but uh, it is interesting to note that there is a Judeo-Christian heritage to both Unitarianism and Universalism, although they don't look anything like they did in the early days. <clears throat> so I felt that as I grew in and I saw Unitarian Universalism evolving, that we evolved kind of beyond that. And that's going to be the focus of more my part two. Um, but I mention this um, because during the early Christian years, and both Unitarian and Universalism, both Unitarianism and Universalism do stem from the formation of Christianity in a loose sense. Uh, there's a history that's kind of fraught with all kinds of conflict, persecution, debate, and evolution. And I'll start by framing this in, if you look at the evolution of today's Catholic Church, they've had seven ecumenical councils, 12 Lateran councils, and two Vatican councils for a total of 21 councils that were involved in the evolution of a faith. And it's funny to think that, that we see an evolution in every Christian religion in that respect. People change their minds. People decide what to believe, decide what not to believe. And, and it's fascinating. I think we go through that same evolution here. Um, the early origins were marked by disputes in the formation at, of the church when the Emperor Constantine converted to Christianity and embraced the faith. He wanted to, he kind of united politically the Eastern and Western Roman empires in the early fourth century. But he also found that there was total chaos when it came to the religion, if you will. And he wanted a common catechism. He wanted them to finally decide what was right. So he convened the first council of Nicaea, which was the first ecumenical council. And this was to be a, uh, 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 this was to define the single catechism, confession, and creed of faith. 
So that's really the origins of the organized Catholic Church at the time. Um, there were people who, who were there who believed in universal salvation, uh, the main tenet of universalism. There were people there who believed in um, the Trinity, Athanasius. And there were people who had a different concept of the divinity of Jesus, Yeshua the Nazarene, and the necessity of things like salvation. Um, even before the Council of Nicaea, Origen, the first proponent of a proto-universalist uh, theology started to debate the existence of the need for the salvation of the soul, even going so far as to state that Lucifer himself was worthy of salvation. Um, this is fascinating when you read it, and this happened before Nicaea. At Nicaea, Arius had a different view, noting that the three gods in one the three gods in one were not necessarily three gods in one because Jesus could not have been a god he didn't exist before he was born so this created a whole like oh my goodness what does this mean to us right I mean, how is it possible for here to have this Trinity? And what is the Holy Spirit or Holy Ghost? None of this is really defined in, this, in the pure scripture of the Bible. So this was a huge argument. But in the end, Athanasius won out. Um, and ironically, the Trinity, as believed by most Christians, is not expressed that way in the, in the new, older New Testament. It's more of a scriptural reference that occurred at the Council of Nicaea. And Arius led the opposition to that. Uh, he argued that Jesus couldn't be a god because he didn't exist prior to the point in time when he was born. How could that be a god? But in the end, Athanasius uh, won the argument. And there's a, a famous portrait of Athanasius trampling on the body of Arius at the Council of Nicaea. Um, it's interesting, most of Arius's followers immediately recanted because they were, they were frightened of persecution. And Trinity, as it became the religious law, um, was a, a, again reversed in a, in a council of Tyre a few years later, which was not recognized as an ecumenical council, it was thrown out. A lot of times they had these religious debates and they said, well, this one's not a valid ecumenical council. Uh, and in the case of Tyre, they threw it out, but they did readmit Arius back into the church, but he was, it's likely assumed by historians that he was poisoned before he could be readmitted. Uh, and Origen himself was, was executed for his beliefs. So these were the first martyrs. And this is a history of conflict, martyr, martyrdom, and evolution. Um, and it's really a fascinating history. So before any, this, this is even before the origin of the word Unitarian or Universalist. All of those words really didn't come into our lexicon until the 1300s at their very earliest that we know of. Although people did kind of talk about it. We have some evidence of it. Um, so Arius's death, and Origen's death remain, remain or, or represent our first tragedy in UU history. Um, so we'll see a few, a few, three main themes here, martyrdom, persecution in the struggle for expression, and the evolution of that expression. So the centuries of conflict and persecution in the development of Christian faith, when they start to involve the European point of view, or Unitarianist point of view, and universalist point of view don't really happen again until the Protestant Reformation. So you might ask what's happening in the meantime between the fourth century and the 16th century. That's a lot of time. Well, there were quite a few people who followed Arius and there were, there were Goths and there were evidences of it in Spain and throughout, throughout Eastern Europe in various places, but the history of that is less well-documented. Many years ago, in 2018, when I delivered this, um, uh, Emery was, was kind enough to lend me his book um, on the history of Unitarian Universalism, and that's probably the only study of that time period that exists that I'm aware of. So for us, in that, those centuries of conflict, 
when we have the anti-Trinitarian since Arius, the first we, we, we see in, it doesn't occur until after the Reformation. And it starts with Anabaptists, starts with John Hus, even before, slightly before the Reformation. Um, they start to represent elements of universalism and univer Unitarianism. And they were called heresies. Any questioning of an established belief going against church canon was a heresy. And thus anyone uh, espousing that would be subject to persecution. And in this case, both Catholics and Protestants. The first one that we really have um, that, that, that steps out and becomes really the first kind of Unitarian is Miguel Cerveto. Miguel Cerveto is known to us as Michael Servetus in English. He was born in Villa Nueva, Spain, and was a true Renaissance man. He was well ahead of his time, studied in mathematics, medicine, meteorology, jurisprudence, cartography, astronomy, and theology. We could have a whole discussion on just Servetus as a single topic. In fact, uh, Michael Schuler, a minister at a church where I grew up, one of the many Unitarian ministers I've had the pleasure to encounter, was a really a devoted scholar of the life of Servetus. Um, I was fortunate to hear him speak about it. But he was the first European to discover and prove the existence of cardiopulmonary circulation. He was able to map it. He made pharmacological, pharmacological discoveries. And he was the personal physician of the Archbishop of Vienne in France. He was more than an amateur theologian as well. He worked for several years on improving translations of the Bible into Latin. This was all, all commissioned by the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church was looking for a better Latin translation of the old Greek and Aramaic texts. And the version on which he collaborated and proofread for accuracy was very nearly chosen by the Catholic Church over what was won out at the time, the Vulgate, which was the, for centuries, the Catholic uh, Latin Bible. It was during this work that Servetus recognized that there was no direct reference in scripture to the Trinity. And that was merely a theological construct of the Nicene Creed as a result of debate. In 1531, he went on to publish De Trinitatis Erroribus, or On the Errors of the Trinity. The next year, he published Dialogorum de Trinitate, Dialogues on the Trinity. And the supplementary work, De Justicia Regni Christi, On the Justice of Christ's Reign, he began a long correspondence of debate in letters with John Calvin. And he was so persistent and so constant in his writing to Calvin, he sent hundreds and hundreds of letters that Calvin stopped responding. He was completely sick of it. He couldn't take it anymore. In 1553, he published yet another work with anti-Trinitarian views. It was called Christianissimi Restitio, the restoration of Christianity, Restitio. Um, a work that sharply rejected the idea of predestination as the idea that God condemned all souls to hell, regardless of worth or merit, without salvation, obviously. In this manner, Servetus was espousing both a Unitarian as well as a Universalist theology. In this period of over 20 years of writing of radical theology, Servetus adopted several pseudonyms, took several breaks to lie low, because he was constantly on the lamp. People were constantly trying to get him um, and recanting several times to avoid persecution. Many, many times he would say, no, I'm a good Catholic. I'm really a good Catholic. And they'd say, OK, go ahead. You're good. You're good to go. Um, so he would then go back and return to the study of medicine and science and working as a doctor. Eventually, his passion for spiritual truth found him entrapped in the Inquisition, and he couldn't stop publishing works. In fact, he published them a bit faster than the authorities could ban them and burn them. So he was found guilty of heresy eventually and sentenced to death, death by Catholics in France. But he had some help and escaped to Switzerland, where he was detained by Calvin, 
because Calvin immediately wanted him detained. And he used many letters against him as evidence that he was a heretic. He very nearly escaped death again by trying to recant, but eventually was executed because he was simply too dangerous. Now, Calvin, Calvin rejoiced at his death publicly and privately. He assumed that by executing Servetus, he could prevent his heresy from spreading. Unfortunately, it had the opposite effect. And the cause was taken up by many, most notably by Sotinus, uh, Sozini, Faustio Sozini. Um, his theology of Jesus was, was solely uh, an interpretation of Yeshua as, a, as, as an intermediary and not a god. Um, and this was really the foundation, a lot of the proto-Unitarian churches in um, Transylvania. And it resulted ultimately through Ferenc David, um, who was the um, court physician, of converting John Sigismund, or Sigismund to uh, Unitarianism. And this is an interesting history as well. I mentioned this last time, it's fun. We had a Unitarian king. There was one Unitarian king in all of history. And that was the king of Transylvania, King Sigismund. Uh, he had a brilliant reign, um, dying, unfortunately, from a gastrointestinal ailment. He was only 30 years old in 1570. He was, achieved an awful lot in his short life. Unfortunately, a lot of the historians seem to think he died in a hunting accident, but um, there's no evidence of that that I can find. He was born a Catholic. He converted three times in his life, first to Lutheran, then to Calvinism, and finally, at the behest of Frank David, to Unitarianism. His transformation was largely due to also his court physician, Giorgio Biandrata, and Francis David, or Frank David. David was an amazing theological debater and he was able to keep his head on, although he was eventually executed and persecuted, um, and, and debate both Calvinists, Catholics, and Lutherans all over Europe. Uh, so at the guidance of uh, Ferenc David, King Sigismund convened the first council and edict of religious freedom in post-Reformation history at Torda, or Torda in uh, what is today um, modern Hungary in 1559. It was a great milestone of justice. It allowed for full freedom of faith and worship, if only for four main faiths at the time, Catholics, Lutherans, Calvinists, and Unitarians, ironically the four religions that Sigismund had himself experienced. We might not consider that a religious freedom today, but at the time, it was a huge advancement. It was a short period of freedom, and it came in the waning years of the Inquisition, which was somewhat timely. Um, while it was short and short lived as his reign, pardon me, it persisted for centuries in a, in a set of codified laws. After Sigismund abdicated and perished, there were movements, unfortunately, in which many synods at the time, convened by Unitarian theologians, were curtailed. They wanted to curtail any further discussion. They wanted to keep things the way they were. The tipping point of that was Ferenc David's assertion that worship of Jesus was optional, which kind of created a mini schism. And in this case, if you will, um, it became kind of like a turning point. Uh, Ferenc David was actually executed and martyred by another fellow Unitarian, the Andrata. So uh, we saw a lot, of, a lot of conflict in here. And, and a lot of these debates at the time were as celebrated as medieval jousts. Uh, it was uh, early, late, late Middle Ages, early Renaissance, and people came and gathered for these. Unfortunately, as this repression came on heavy, there were also further repressions. Unitarian churches that had been 
saved or created by Unitarians were burned down or appropriated by Catholics in the region. And it was this uh, Shekli people on the border of Romania and Hungary that kept Unitarianism alive for centuries. So that's a, a sort of a Unitarian uh, background. In Universalism, from Oregon to all the way up until the times of, uh, of the High Renaissance, there really wasn't much going on. But it's funny to think here for a second and pause. Arianism and, or, and the original teachings of Oregon, neither of these really represent what we would consider universalism or Unitarianism today. They're really proto versions of it. Uh, but we, it's important to note that our origins go back that far. And um, we wouldn't recognize in our lives here today, in our, in our spiritual community, what arguments they were having back then. We weren't really certain at that time in, say, the early formation of the church, what the Bible was even going to look like. At the time, the Bishop of Alexandria and others were in the midst of canonizing that work. And it wasn't until around the year 800 that the New Testament was fully canonized and set and codified as a single text to be worshipped, um, to be read and followed. So uh, it's interesting to note that when we had this, we had we had really a completely different set of precepts, but this is the origin of both the Unitarian and the Universalists. That's really the part one in ancient history. It goes back farther than many of us think. Um, what I'm going to get into next time in part two will be a discussion on how that suddenly came into the forefront with terms called Unitarian and called Universalist by name in the 17th century onwards in modern history.